to everyone. Good morning. Stand with me as we sing this morning, All Hail King Jesus. Father's Day. 
And in 1972, President Richard Nixon established a permanent national observance of Father's Day to be held on the third Sunday of June. That's why we celebrate Father's Day every year, because of Sonora Smart God and her relationship with her father. Spokane, Washington. What did you say, Spokane? Yes, they're from Spokane. No, Eastern Washington State is from the same thing. Thank you. So, uh, in the way of announcements, you guys are squeaking up down there. Okay. <laughs> so in the way of announcements, we uh, just as a reminder, we have had a change in service order, and that is we no longer have Sunday evening service. No. We have Thursday evening yes. service. Yes. At 6 p.m. on Thursday evening. Sunday morning at 11, Thursday evening at 6. Jeannie, you still hold Bible study on Sunday mornings, is that correct? Is that at 9.30? Whatever. Whatever. 9.30-ish. Yes. Sunday morning downstairs. All yeah. right. And there's one other thing that we need to talk about today. Besides fathers, there is something else very important that happened this week. Edith had a birthday. Oh, yeah. Edith, come on. We want to say happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. and for her ministry. Oh, how she has blessed us so yes. many times. And God, we ask that your special abundant blessing would be upon her in this coming new year for her. Lord, that you would make ready her pathway and that she may walk straight before you. And Lord, that you would bless her abundantly in all that is done and all she says in the life to come. And God, we thank you for this and we give her our great blessing. Amen. In Jesus. Amen. Do you want to say anything? Thank you. <laughs> She's so talkative. And our daughter, she got a headache. And she bit Davis Tire House the other day, and hit is hurting her so bad right in the back of her neck. It's like a migraine, migraine, but she thinks it's the arthritis and stuff that from all them wrecks that she had, and her neck was broke. And she's hurt so bad this morning. She called me and wished me a happy Father's Day. She's just about in tears. Crystal? Yeah. Crystal. Yeah. Crystal. Yeah. Yes. We yes. Yes, we do miss them. There's several others that were missing here today. Dolores and Oli uh, are still not with us. Uh, Pastor visited with them yesterday. And Dolores remains a little weak. She was afraid she might fall asleep in service. So he told her, it's okay if you come and you fall asleep, I'll just preach louder. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do what I remember Dolores and Elder. Yes. God will give her strength. And uh, they'll be able to be back with us soon. Yes. Now, several weeks ago, uh, I announced that we were going to have a new roof. And then it started to rain. Mm -hmm. So, tomorrow we get a new roof. Yes. The roofers called and apologized for not meeting their deadline. They had planned to come earlier in the month and put the new roof on. Uh, but they have committed to being here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. 8 a.m. All right. So a couple of days and we should have a new roof on this lovely yes. old building. We're thanking God Please for that. God. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right. Let's, let's sing this morning. Let's sing a couple of songs. It's going to help me with that. He's the Lord of glory. Let's sing about it. <laughs>
love you, Lord, and we lift our voice. Many times we, on Father's Day especially, we want to tell our Father how much we love how much we appreciate us for everything that he's done for us. Our Heavenly Father gave all. Yes, he is. He came as a sacrifice for us. He gave all. Not just a portion, not just what he could, but he gave all. We're here today to honor him. Let's say we love you and we lift our voice. Many times the words that come out of our mouth in certain circumstances are not sweet, are not loving. But when we lift our voice to him, let's make it that way to him. We love Wednesday is our anniversary. 
When's oh, this coming Wednesday? Yeah, How many years? Fifty-four. Fifty-four years. 54. Well, happy anniversary yeah. to the both of you. Wow. Praise God. We're getting old, I guess. Huh? <laughs> That's older than you. Didn't say you're that just, was that long ago. It was you're very, very, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dan. Oh One. <laughs> Dan has a daughter. Dan has a daughter. All right. I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> Stan. Dan, another Dan. So Stan, what an ass, not a Dan. 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 Are you a father? Yeah, I got two kids. Two kids. Two kids and two grandkids. All All right. (laughs) All right, in the back row there, I know we have Leroy. Are you proud of this row? All right. That's wonderful. It's so good to have you with us today. Celebrating with us. (laughs) Amen. Well, I'm proud of my dad, even a Baptist preacher. Really strict. He he carried a big brush and trimmed it good. Uh-huh. But he was a man of his word. What he told you, didn't matter what it was, you could take it to the bank. And you know, I've tried to pattern my life kind of in that same line with my kids. You know what I told them I wanted to be able to say my, that's what my dad told me, and I don't have to doubt it. Mm-hmm. And I got we had three kids. We got one. Uh, our oldest son, he passed away, had a massive heart attack at 55 or 50 years old. But uh, God is good. Yes. Isn't he? Amen. Love him every day. Amen. Yes. He may have four, four children, one daughter and three boys. Thank you, fathers. Here's some information about what children think of their fathers at different ages. A four-year-old says, my dad can do anything, right? A seven-year-old, my dad knows a lot, a whole lot. A nine-year-old, My dad doesn't know quite everything. A 12-year-old, oh well, naturally dad does not know that either. A 14-year-old, my dad is so out of step with reality. Can you hear it? A 20-year-old. My dad is so hopelessly old-fashioned. A 25-year-old. Dad knows a little about it, but not much. A 30-year-old. I may ask dad what he thinks about that. A 35-year-old. Before we decide, let's get Dad's opinion. A 45-year-old. I wonder what Dad will think about this. A 55-year-old. My dad knows something about literally everything. (laughs) And a 65-year-old. I wish I could talk it over with my dad once more. Yeah. 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 We go through life's changes. Dads, we love you. I was feeling pretty low, and I thought, you know, I, I, 
put a lot of work into uh, ministry and to uh, the Word of God and study hard and all of that. And come 62 miles to, to deliver it, and there are only uh, seven people to, uh, <laughs> to, to uh, respond to whatever it is. And then uh, I went on to Facebook and discovered that there were 22 other people who were watching it live on Facebook. So uh, I suddenly became aware that uh, not all is lost. And so thank God for Facebook. I know that uh, I know that sometimes we get a little upset and discouraged with Facebook, but uh, it has certainly has its value. Pastor, I think. I think I saw there were 39 views all together. So, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Praise God. Well, uh, this morning, I'm not uh, bringing up Facebook. So, uh, you just did. If anybody else can uh, can do that and, and uh, follow the message, uh, that would be great. But uh, it, uh, here we go. Wait just a minute. It just happened. Bear with me, please. You get there. My goodness. There's Hope Church. All right. All right. Now, these poor folks on Facebook, uh, Thursday night, I put it here. You know, I just didn't know what, where to put it right. And so I just laid it here, and uh, the folks who were watching my Facebook, what they got was a short-sleeved person with saggy skin <laughs> and lots of this, you know. And, and so hopefully today uh, it will be a, a little better. Hey, this is, uh, I've got some good news. And uh, I have some bad news for, uh, for, for fathers today. <clears throat> the good news is that uh, the telephone company tells us that now we are getting as many phone calls on Father's Day for we dads as moms get on Mother's Day. Isn't that cool? The bad news is that most of the calls on Father's Day are collect. <laughs> uh, uh, I remember uh, in, in a Sunday school class, uh, the teacher said, Father's Day, uh, it, it, tell me about Father's Day, and, and asking the children. And a little boy raised his hand and he said, well, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only the gifts are a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Mark Twain said this, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. I remember, I remember all those stages, and particularly my number one son, my first son, who was and is today a very smart young man. But uh, a lot of times he was smarter than he he thought he was smarter than he really was. If you understand what I'm saying. But I remember those stages, particularly with him, when at about 14, he decided that dad and mom really knew nothing at all. But uh, thank God, now at uh, 50 years old, he's, uh, he's, he's come around to, uh, to that point where he at least calls and gets my, uh, my opinion on things. Praise the Lord. Well, God is good. It's good to see Corlee with us because she has been just out of it for a while, and uh, we're glad to have her back. Someone uh, wrote these humorous words entitled, uh, The World According to Dad, and th these are words that most dads have said 
at some time or another, and I particularly remember my dad having said these things, and probably I have said them myself. For instance, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I remember that a few times. And quiet! I'm watching the ball game. No matter what was going on. And dad always said, don't forget to check the oil. Remember that? <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know why. I don't think the oil ever budged, but that was one of the, don't forget to check it out. And then Dad always said, bring back the change. <laughs> that was common. And, and often Dad would say, how should I know? Ask your mother. <laughs> Some of you. Some of you uh, know what that's all about, obviously. Uh, and, and then Dad said this a lot. I, I'll yeah. never forget this one. Dad, Dad said to us, what do you think I'm made of money? Yeah. <laughs> He'd also say, do we have a tree that grows money in the backyard? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and then uh, I remember this when Dad would say, when I was your age, I walked five miles to school. school. And back, and it was uphill both ways. <laughs> and then I remember Dad saying, uh, "Hey, who's paying the bills here anyway?" Uh, born in a barn. Yes. And if you break your leg, don't come running to me. I never could figure that. Out. How could I come running if I broke my leg? And then Dad would say, don't put your feet on the furniture, your mother will kill you. <laughs> and then he would say, get down before you kill yourself. Uh, second thought, go ahead. <laughs> and quit playing with your food. You ever say that to your kids? Quit playing with your food. Be quiet. I'm trying to think. <laughs> and yeah, I remember that a lot. And this one, so if you don't quit right now, I'm calling your mother. And then uh, one that's special to me, just wait. One day you'll have kids of your own. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then this one, I seem to practice a bit because uh, at 75, uh, I think I owe it to myself. Dad would sit in his easy chair and watch TV, and uh, once in a while he would grunt a snore, wake himself up, and he'd say, I wasn't asleep, I was just resting my eyes. <laughs> and it's funny how he could see through his eyelids, you know, uh, what was going on on television. Uh, I, I remember reading this, a college student said to his parents, please send food packages. All they serve here is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and another son wrote to his dad, said, dear dad, please let me hear from you more often, even if it's only five or 10. <laughs> There's some sort of a, uh, uh, of a code in that. Now, I know it's true that there are those of us here who probably uh, did not have a loving, attentive father, uh, and uh, you perhaps aren't even fully aware of what fatherhood entails or what it's all about. My wife being one of those whose father left her at nine years of age, three children at home, promising to come see her often and rarely did. We finally, in her later years of life, had to go searching for him, look him up because he was incognito somewhere. We only knew of his whereabouts in a uh, in a small area in Sacramento. And so we went looking for him, and I'm glad we did. But then uh, I met my wife, uh, she not knowing what a real father was about, 
And I, being quite young, being an evangelist and, and uh, having uh, <clears throat> lots of words to say, but hadn't yet been able to put those words to use in front of my wife, but then she met my father. Uh, right after our honeymoon, we moved to Wyoming and, uh, and uh, started our ministry from there, and she met my dad. And quickly, he became her dad. And uh, she found what it meant to be a real father and a real dad. And uh, so we bless her dad for the things that he taught her about life. And there's many things that she could write down. And I think she's <laughs> talked of them before in this congregation. There are many things that she learned and many things that... Uh, that, that have, have been her life pattern, which came from her dad and his early time in her life. And even after he left her, she learned so much and uh, became a part, uh, a very important part of her, of her sibling. She was the middle sibling, an older brother, a younger sister. And so uh, her mom had to go to work full time and Judy became the... Uh, the matriarch of that family, and so there were some real learning things that she had going for her in those young years of nine. And so uh, not all is bad, and we can always look at the brighter side of things and find out that God has a plan. And his plan is, is consistent, it is constant, it never changes, and as you look back on your life, you'll see many times when you've wondered what in the world was that all about? But I'm here to tell you that it's all part of God's plan. God is the author of your life, of your pathway. And he is the completer of it as well. And all those things, whether you judge them as being good or bad, are still righteous in him. They're good in God. And so I'm challenging you and inviting you this morning that you'll find the good in uh, your parents, moms and dads, in spite of what you might have endured or gone through, that you'll find somewhere there the opportunity to say, thank God I went through that because here I am now, the person I am today, and God is good because he restores everything that the canker worm tries to destroy. And he does that in a hundredfold, and so we can praise him for that. Well, having said all of that, I would like you to turn with me, if you would, to Job, the first chapter. Now, Job is right ahead of Psalms. <coughs> Job, the first chapter. When we think about uh, being a good father, <clears throat> we can scan the Bible, and uh, we can find some wonderful examples of fatherhood in the Bible. Men who led their families in the presence of God. There are men like Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many more. Now, while all the stories of these wonderful men of God, all of whom individually had their own doubts and fears, had their own times of dismay, had their own times when they were troubled and when the things seemed to go awry. While all these stories are very inspiring, the man that uh, I really want to talk about for a few minutes this morning is the man Job. And uh, let's go to this text, uh, the uh, first chapter of Job, starting with the first verse. And we're going to deal with the first five verses here. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now let's just stop there and uh, investigate that first verse because it has so much as far as an example of what a father should be. Let's just take four, four points here. Number one, 
The Bible says he was a perfect man. Now, the word perfect, as you probably know, really means complete. In other translations, it may say pious man. The word in the, uh, in the Hebrew is a very simple word transliterated to us, T-A-W-N, tong is the Hebrew word, tong. And it means having had a complete veneration for the fear of God. In other words, being totally and completely given over to the supremacy of God having no doubt in his mind that God was his source, that God was the directive of his life. And so the Bible calls him a perfect or a complete man, tall, meaning he was fully in line with Father God in what, whatever God would say, whatever God would want him to do, he was there. The second example of Job is found in the word upright. Job was upright, the Bible says. The Hebrew word is yashur. It's actually two words, yah, y-a-w, transliterated to English, y-a-w, and shur, s-h-u-r. Yashur, and, and the word Yashur literally means all right. <laughs> Just simply all right. Now look, what it really refers to is a man who is all right with everybody around him. So when people talk about him, they talk about how kindly he is. They talk about how gentle he is. They talk about how merciful he is. They talk about all the lovely things about him because that's what he exudes in his natural life. Now follow me here. Each one of these are important to see together. If, in the first place, a man is completely given over to God and trusts the Lord with all of his heart, he is sure to be also a man who is loved and appreciated by people around him. Can you say amen to that? Absolutely. The third example that is found in this verse is that Job feared God. Here again is Yah being God and fear is Ray, R-A-Y transliterated into English. Yahweh is the word in Hebrew. And it literally means one who reveres God. For the word fear is not a fear where we are afraid of God and so we try to hide as is found in Genesis, the third chapter with, with uh, Adam and Eve trying to hide from God because of their uh, disobedience. But this is a place of reverence before God. To reverence God. He had a deep, true concern uh, in, in his heart of what God was, what God was thinking, who God was, and, and he revered or reverenced the presence of God. I'm here to tell you, folks, not just fathers, but all of us should understand this beautiful word, Yahweh. For Yahweh will keep us on a daily basis in our walk with God. To know that God is ever present with us. To know that God is continually within us. But beyond that, to know that God's presence with us, around us, above us, the Bible says, He surrounds us and He is within us. <coughs> To understand that and to have that in mind is to reverence God. 
is to have our lives in a position where knowing that we are in the presence of God, we are cautious, we are careful. You know, uh, the, uh, the beauty of what I always said to my boys and to my daughter as well, what my dad would say to us, his children, and that was, remember, you are a Warford. Well, how could I forget that? I mean, you know, here I am, 15, 16 years old, how I... How could I forget that I'm a warfare? But no, no, that's not really what he meant. If you disgrace the warfare name, then you disgrace me as your father. You disgrace our family as a family. So when you leave this house, remember who you are. And I'm here to tell you that in God, it's really a good idea when you move out in the morning, when you wake up and get out of bed and, and shake yourself and say, thank God for another day. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it no matter what happens today. But it also is, it behooves us to remember that we carry His name. We are a people called by His name. And so whatever we do in the presence of God throughout the day, God never leaves us. God never forsakes us. He's always there by spirit form. God is with us. And being with us, I'm cognizant of the fact always to reverence His name. Yes. To be careful that I show forth God, and not just Don Warford's desires and wants and, and Don Warford's uh, uh, life, his natural being. And so being, being in awe of God is roshe, or, uh, uh, yare, meaning to reverence the name and reverence the presence of God. The fourth fatherly example I found in Job, the first chapter, was this. He eschewed, you see that word, eschewed evil. The word eschewed in the, in the Hebrew is soar, soar. And it's really spelled in English S O O R, soar. Soar means turn off, to turn off. Here's what happens with Job. The Bible says that Job eschewed or turned off evil. Whenever evil came knocking at his door, whenever something in his life was, uh, was challenged by evil thought or evil works or evil deeds, he simply turned it off. Now, I had someone say to me a long time ago, it's just as simple as turning it off. And I said, oh, I wish that were true. My personal, physical, natural desires, I wish it were true that I could just turn them off and, 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 and it, everything would be okay. But Job, the Bible says, was able to walk away from it. To simply avoid it, and this comes from the strongest concordance, to walk away from, to avoid, to shun, to move away, to shut it down. So I began to pray from this older gentleman's thoughts given to me, how you could just turn it off. After I realized that it was a great battle most times to simply turn it off. I begin to ask God to show me how to avoid this thing, to shun this thing, to move away from this thing, to shut this thing down. I'm not talking about one single thing, but other things in my life. How do I do that? And God began to teach me how that was done. And not always in an easy fashion. But he always said to me, turn about face, turn about, go the other way. 
And I learned that oftentimes I had placed myself in the position where I was tempted and where I was uh, troubled greatly about even the thought of what I wanted to do, let alone the access of doing it. And oftentimes guilt would just ravage my soul and my mind. I, I don't know if you've been there or not, but I have been there. I have, I've done that. But God showed me that this is what repentance is all about, turning around and going the other direction. A lot of times we see something flash before us and it looks so good we go after it. And, uh, but we must at that moment stop and begin to recognize how this thing is going to play out and how this thing is going to work in our lives and is this going to bring honor to the Father because it feels good. And I found out that most of those things that I was doing that felt good at the moment were not lasting. Can you say you back to that? They were very, uh, they were good in the now, but uh, 15, 20, 30, 50 minutes, maybe an hour, two or three, or perhaps even the next day, I was thinking, wow, you know, uh, that wasn't so good after all. And so it is that we need to, instead of, of going into or finding ourselves in the position where we are tempted, to turn around and go the other direction. And oftentimes it's hard because the flesh wants to do it. But the spirit is greater than the flesh. And you are a spirit being. Amen. And the spirit that resides within your human flesh is powerful. And it is given unto you that Spirit God may have all of the redemptive process of righteousness in your life and it can give you a life of fulfillment and happiness and joy without the evil aspects. Amen? amen. Absolutely amen. Now, let's go on. Verse 2. And this now is the results of the first four things that the Bible talks about Job. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Oh, God help us. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one in his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Wow. Now, let me rehearse this one more time through and tell you this. That the four things that we talked about that were Job's attributes before God in the Spirit brought forth these results. He was a man with, with wealth. He had a wealth of children he had, who loved each other. He had a wealth of, of, uh, of material things. But now look. Wealth can be measured in many different ways. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind that a person who does what Job did will find wealth. Wealth doesn't always mean to us today dollars and cents or financial security. Wealth can mean so many other things. Wealth can mean happiness. Wealth can mean satisfaction in life. Oh, wealth can mean peace Amen. in your life. Wealth can mean that, uh, that in the midst of struggles and, and all the perplexities of life, you are able to rest and be secure in the arms of Jesus, knowing that God does everything well. But in Job's case, he was wealthy in all manner. 
The Bible says he had a united family. I'll tell you, there's nothing in my estimation that is more precious than a united family. In my years of ministry, I have come across so many families who are at odds with each other. Sisters not talking to sisters, brothers not talking to brothers, all seem to be just a, uh, in, in, a, in an uproar. But oh, it's a wonderful thing when you go into a family where brothers and sisters are united. They love each other and they communicate with each other. Oh, I know we all have different lifestyle. We all have different ways we go and we're not, uh, you know, in that family unit as we used to be. But it's so wonderful when the kids get together and they're not fussing and they're not trying to outdo one another. They're just having fun. They're just enjoying one another. That's a wealthy thing to possess in this hour, in this day. And I hope that you have that kind of family. If not, let's pray that God will continue to bless you with that and give you such a, a family unit, even if your family is growing. Verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone out, or about, that Job sent and sanctified them, that is his children, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God <laughs> in their hearts. Thus did Job continually Here's an example that can never be minimized or marginalized <clears throat> in a father's life. One of the most important examples of a father ought to be prayer. <clears throat> this scripture tells us that Job <clears throat> prayed every morning. For his seven sons and his three daughters, individually, before God. Just in case, just in case, they might have turned away from God in the last 24 hours. He stood fast and he prayed for them. I'll tell you what, uh, Prayer changes things. And there's nothing quite like the prayer of a father whose progeny, whose children, he watches and he desires that they be what God wants them to be and that they become good men and women to the people around them, that they have all of those glorious attributes that Job seemed to possess. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you, men and women, not just for men, but for each one of us, pray for your children daily. God is listening. Spirit is working. You may not see it happening. Don't give up on your children. I raised mine in a classic pastor's home. I know the stories about PKs, preacher's kids. But uh, as they got older, they, uh, they decided that, oh, enough of dad, enough of mom's teaching, and we're going to do our own thing. And I suppose all children will do that whether you're a preacher's kid or not. But oh, I want to tell you that as they've gotten older, it isn't that they have become any wiser or any more intent on being God's people, but 
our prayer has become stronger and more fervent. If you're hearing uh, that buzzing noise and wondering what it is, somebody's trying to call me. So, you know, the buzzing of my, of my phone. Praise God. We need to pray for our children because God answers prayer and because God is saying, are you going to give up or are you going to stand steadfast? And I know that for Judy and I and our family, we're standing steadfast and God is moving by His Spirit. Amen. God is doing good things. And so we're just saying, praise the Lord. Thank you, God. But I just wanted to challenge you this morning. Don't give up. Don't stop. Because these are God's gift to you. And as God's gift to you, uh, you are responsible for their lives and for seeing them through in victory. And by responsible, I mean, you know, I can't, I can't go into my children's families and say, this is the way it's going to be. In fact, we have totally withdrawn from that and have given them unto the Lord and begun to thank God. We don't pray begging God for it. We just thank God on a daily basis for their lives and what they're doing and what God is doing in them. I have a thing here by Bruce Howell. Bruce Howell tells the story of a father and his son and daughter who were eight and ten. They went swimming in the Atlantic Ocean <coughs> of New Jersey a few years back. They were all good swimmers. In fact, they were great swimmers. And they were a long way from shore. And they became separated when the dad realized that the tide was carrying them out to sea. Well, he called out to his daughter, Mary, I'm going to shore for help. If you get tired, just turn on your back. You can float all day on your back. So I'll come back for you. Float on your back. He and his son made it to shore, swam to shore, but they were frantic about the young daughter. Finally, after four hours of searching in boats and the like, they found her far out to sea. She was calmly swimming on her back. She wasn't frightened in the least. There was a tremendous amount of relief when the calm girl was finally brought back to shore. Everyone wondered how she could be so calm. Well, she said, Daddy said to me he would come for me and I could float all day. So I swam and floated because I knew he would come for me. Hmm. This is exactly what Jesus is all about. Amen. He will always come for us. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He'll always be there. I know that there are times when, as a father, I was so troubled, what do I do? What do I do about this? Especially with my daughter. My boys seemed to kind of flow through, but my daughter was a bit more troublesome. <laughs> and that she had a lot going on in her little body, and the hormones and all of that. Wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, weeping, crying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Can you talk to me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. So I would go downstairs and we would sit and talk and she would cry. She didn't know why she was crying. I asked her, she had no reason for it. She would just cry. I had no words to say. 
So I went to God and I said, God, what is it? What do you, what do you want me to say to her? Because this went on night after night for a long period of time. What can I say to her? And God said, say nothing. Just hold her. Hold her close to you and tell her you understand. And that's the kind of relationship God wants to give every one of us. Yes. We wait sometimes to hear a word from God that will change us or that will move the mountain that looms in front of us. And God is saying to us, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Learn of me, take my yoke upon you, trust me. He brings us to his side and he holds us there. That's all we need is the full apprehension, the full concept, the full veneration that God is there never to leave us, never to forsake us. And in the troublesome times of our lives, we can be certain that he's there and he's holding us close to himself, saying, it's all right, I'm here, everything is okay. Now I ask you, my God and Father, whom you have taught us to cry to you, Abba, you are our beloved Father. We learn of you, and you have never forsaken us, you've never forgotten us, you've never let us down. You have been faithful in all things unto this your children. Oh God, oh, how can we say thank you? Our hearts shall home cry unto you, oh God, we give blessing unto you, for you are our beloved Father. And you have taught us, come to me. And God, even in this moment today, we come to you. Oh, we have our, we have our areas of trouble and our time of, of dismay. We have our perplexities, but God, we know that you hold us dear. We know that you love us. And there is no power in heaven, nor earth, nor under the earth. There is nothing that can separate us from your great, wondrous love. And so, God, this morning, we in turn want to say, we love you. Oh, we love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you, thank you for being our faithful Father. Cause us in our minds and in our eyes and in our understanding, cause us, Lord, now I pray, to understand what it means to give ourselves wholly unto you, to surrender everything to you, knowing that you do all things well. And knowing that the steps of every man is ordered by you. Yes. God, we just surrender to you this morning. We thank you and cause us to be aware of your presence. Yes. And this we speak because of Jesus, in whom we live and move and have a very being. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen, amen. There's so many things I'd like to tell you, yeah? face to face. I either lack the words or fail to find the time and the place. But in this special letter, Dad, you'll find at least in part the feelings that the passing years have left within my heart. The memories of childhood days and all that you have done to make our home a happy place and growing up so much fun. I still recall the walks we took, the games we often played, 
those confidential chats we had while resting in the shade. The letter comes to thank you, Dad. Hallelujah. For needed words of praise. The counsel and the guidance too that shaped my grown up days. My words of mine can tell you, Dad. No words of mine can tell you, Dad, the things I really feel. But you must know my love for you is lasting and it's warm and it's real. You made my world a better place. And through the coming years, I'll keep those memories of you as cherished souvenirs. My daddy went on to be with the Lord at 75 years of age. He was my age. On his way to a baptismal service in the Platte River in Casper, Wyoming. When he missed the road to the river and negotiated a turn in his little Nissan vehicle. And as he was negotiating the turn to get back on the road, was struck broadside by an oncoming semi-truck and died in my mother's arms. My mother was crippled and my grandmother in the back seat. I never saw my dad. I, I, I didn't see him in his crushed form, I refused to look. But oh, I'm telling you, thank God, thank God for dads who have enough reason and understanding and who have enough of God life that they're willing to stand up and be a real man of faith. Not just to their children, but to everybody around them. And I had such a dad, and I bless you, Dad, today. Wherever you stand or wherever you are, hear my words, I bless you. And I'm sure that you bless your dad, as Grady said this morning. I'm sure that you bless your dad. And if your dad wasn't kind and gentle and nice to you, bless him anyway. Because he had a purpose in your life. Amen. God bless you.